the best breakfast. Does breakfast come before dinner? Something of an odd question, I know, but not as odd as you might think. You see, if you do not value or eat breakfast, you're, not, you're going to assume that breakfast is irrelevant to your enjoyment of dinner. In the day-to-day -day life of meals, we're free to eat or not eat as we please. But imagine for a moment that you were required to eat both breakfast and dinner. Which should come first? Is there a proper order? Most people would naturally say, of course, breakfast comes before dinner. That seems obvious. And that's how we've always done it. Yet you can bet your bottom dollar that there's someone out there who thinks otherwise. Tortured fundamentalism. They say, I searched my Bible and there's no verse that says thou shalt not eat breakfast before dinner. Therefore, we're free to eat in whichever order we want. I will have my dinner first, then my breakfast, and I will teach my kids to do the same. Now, this may appear, appear an absurd argument. And that's because I deliberately wanted to highlight the absurdity. This is how many people approach matters of faith and practice with no regard to the meaning of what it is they're doing or not doing, or whether or not the scripture might indicate a proper direction without saying outright what is the way to go. At a certain level of fundamentalism is required for Christian life. We must always go to the word because it is our only rule of faith and practice. Yet there is a kind of fundamentalism that actually ends up undermining our faith. It treats the Bible forensically like a binary series of ones and zeros that can be divided and categorized with different commands and propositional truths clearly delineated into separate bowls that don't touch. Some have grown somewhat weary or skeptical of systematic theology because it can sometimes treat the scriptures this way. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible is a cohesive book of God's revealed truth that can withstand the most intense study, but it is not a textbook or a programming code or a user manual. For the modern scientific mind, the Bible can be frustratingly imprecise. Yet, that is the way God wants it to be. By his spirit, he collated the narratives and poetry and prophetic imagery. He preserved only some of the personal and corporate letters of the New Testament era. He gave the case law of the Torah without a law for every single circumstance. He gave us Old Testament quotes in the New Testament that were not exact copies. He gave us apparent contradictions and riddles and certain passages that are somewhat opaque to every generation. Yet, in this complexity and seeming imprecision, we're provided a rich and deep whole. It means that to go beyond the surface, we must don the intellect that God has given us and plunge into the depths of that ocean of truth in the hopes of finding its pearls and great treasures. Sadly, too many modern Christians treat God's word like a flat desert, thinking that everything worth knowing or doing protrudes from the surface in an obvious way. If it cannot be obviously observed, it must not exist. Moving toward the point, what has this to do with breakfast? Let me return to the allegory I began with. Imagine that you are required to eat both breakfast and dinner. Even though the scripture may say, thou shalt, sorry, even though the, the, the scripture may not say, thou shalt eat breakfast before dinner, we can know with certainty that breakfast should be eaten before dinner. Why? Because that's what breakfast is is. It is in the very name and meaning of the word that it should become first. Breakfast is for the breaking of one's fast from not eating. If one eats dinner first, then they're not really breaking their fast later on when they eat breakfast, are they? Now, let's say in this allegory that a certain person who lacks understanding has gone and eaten their dinner first. Is there any hope for them? Why, of course, we make mistakes, we get things mixed up, someone should point out that person's folly, and then they can make adjustments for the future. No permanent damage was done, 
But in order to give both breakfast and dinner their proper place, that person should make change for the future. Not only is it apparent on the surface that breakfast obviously comes before dinner, great minds trained with godly wisdom could investigate the matter and write books about it, I'm sure. We could also look at the practice of the saints down through history, observing what they always understood and practiced. Have you grown tired of my parable yet? What am I getting at with breakfast and dinner? This parable is about the two sacraments of the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. We have these two ordinances that are given to us and commanded by Jesus Christ. They're not optional for the Christian. So we must practice them both. But the question we ask is, does one come before the other? And like the parable of breakfast, I say a resounding yes. Baptism comes before the Lord's Supper. Now, although you will not find a Bible verse saying so, it is obviously so. It is built into the meaning of baptism that it comes first, just as breakfast is before dinner inherently in its meaning. Simply speaking, baptism is about our being cleansed and joined to Jesus in the new covenant. And Lord's Supper is about perpetual partaking and remembering Jesus in the new covenant. So simply put, what business does someone have remembering Jesus' sacrifice if they have not taken Jesus' sacrifice for themselves? And if the response is, well, I do believe in Jesus, then the follow-up question is, why have you not taken the sign of belonging to Jesus in baptism? God deals with the heart, but we deal with externalities. And Jesus gave us external markers to indicate our unity with Jesus. For example, you shall know them by their fruit. So to push the picture, you shall know a Christian by his or her baptism. This is the external sign of belonging to Jesus. And so we take that sign before we take the ongoing sign of the Lord's Supper. In picture, baptism represents regeneration. And the Lord's Supper is connected to sanctification, being made holy. Can regeneration come before sanctification? Then why would we put the signs of those things around the other way? Bible and history. In the Old Testament, they had two prototype sacraments that foreshadow those of the church. They had circumcision and Passover. Both of these have big differences to baptism and communion, but there are many similarities as well. Interestingly, circumcision was about signifying being joined to God's covenant people. And Passover was a perpetual meal of remembrance of God's salvation for that people, much like our ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And interestingly, God made it clear that Passover was for his people who had taken the sign of belonging. If we go to Exodus chapter 12, verse 48, it says, If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. God made it very clear that people shouldn't partake of Passover unless they had taken the sign of belonging to his covenant people. Why should it be practiced any different in the new covenant? Is it now okay to join the body of Christ in their communion without having first joined Christ in his death? See Romans chapter 6 verse 4 and Colossians chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. Even apart from the obvious nature of the meaning of baptism and the implications from scripture, we also have the testimony of the forefathers in the faith. Even from the earliest days of the church, they have been careful to baptize first, then do the Lord's Supper after. In the, Didi in, in the Didache, uh, section 9.5, it says, But let no one eat or drink of the Eucharist with you, except for those baptized in the name of the Lord. And in Justin Martyr's First Apology, section 66, it says, And this food is called among us the Eucharist, of which no one is allowed to partake but 
the man who believes that the things which we teach are true and who has been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sins and unto regeneration and who is living as Christ has enjoined. Okay, now what? How should we straighten all of this out? Let's say, uh, I hadn't thought about it, but now that you mention it, I can see what you're saying. What do I do? If you're a parent, you should keep your unbaptized children back from the table. A hard thing to do, I know, especially if you teach them, have, if you, especially if um, you thought it was okay beforehand. But if you hold to believers' baptism and your child is not old enough to be baptized yet, then they certainly shouldn't be at the table because the one who cannot or has not taken on faith for themselves certainly cannot discern the body of Christ, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If they believe and can discern the body, then they should be baptized. If you're an older believer and you've been partaking the Lord's Supper while unbaptized, then abstain. And seek baptism at the earliest opportunity. What are you waiting for? You obviously already want what Christ has for you. Come and be washed, be sanctified, be justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Part of the beautiful picture of baptism and the Lord's Supper is that there is a special symbolism in coming to the table once you've taken the sign. Beforehand you were outside Christ. But now you have been washed. You are warmly invited into fellowship with the church in Christ. Once you were alienated, and now you are in communion with Christ and his people around the table of the king. Politicians in Australia do this weird thing where they have an election campaign launch party. Why is it weird? Because they do it halfway through their campaigns. Everybody has already seen them campaigning for months now. And so it comes as a strange surprise to be told that they're only now launching their campaign. It's out of order and somewhat disingenuous. De facto couples do this weird thing where they live as a married couple for years before making it official in a wedding that has been stripped of much of its meaning because it's all around the wrong way. If, you, if you're a de facto couple who has been convicted of sin and you got married as a result, that's good work. I'm not taking a dig at you doing the right thing, but just pointing out how back the front it all is. Partaking of the Lord's Supper before baptism is just like these two examples. It's mixed around the wrong way and undermines the meaning. It's better to deny oneself and fast from the table until the appointed time Take the washing of regeneration and then dig into the best breakfast you ever had. The body and blood of Christ broken and shed for you.